Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you this morning. I hope you enjoyed a little uh, wake up music from the Grateful Dead. Uh, I'm Jenny Steele from UC Santa Cruz, and this is my colleague, Robin Chandler, who's also from UC Santa Cruz. We're uh, happy to be here today to talk to you, tell you a bit of the story about the Grateful Dead archive and uh, its history with us. Uh, UC Santa Cruz found out about the existence of the Grateful Dead archive in 2006. We were informed by our uh, professor of music, Fred Lieberman, who is a longtime student of the Grateful Dead, who uh, actually has collaborated quite a bit with Mickey Hart, who's one of the two drummers for the band. Uh, they've written several books together, and they collaborate regularly. Fred teaches a course on the Grateful Dead that usually has an enrollment of three to 400 students. And Mickey comes to campus uh, every time Fred teaches the class and does a guest lecture. So there was a close relationship already in place when, um, when this story began for the library. So Mickey mentioned to Fred that the band had a large archive and was looking for a home for the archive. They wanted some place that would appreciate it, that would process it and make it available and uh, care for it in perpetuity. So uh, we then were informed of this in the library and got in touch with the band's business manager and expressed our interest. So we went up to San Rafael to meet with the business manager and uh, then he took us to the warehouse in Marin County where the archive was located. But one of the things we talked about with the business manager was why we thought Santa Cruz was a good fit. There were a number of reasons why. Obviously, the relationship that Mickey had with Fred was an important one. But also, uh, the fact that Jerry Garcia, as a child, spent his summers with cousins who live in the Santa Cruz Mountains, just north of Santa Cruz proper. And for anyone who's a real deadhead, you know that uh, Jerry was missing part of one of his fingers. And uh, that accident actually happened when his brother accidentally chopped off that portion of the finger when they were both quite young and uh, playing together, obviously in kind of a, <laughs> a violent way. <laughs> So um, also, the campus for a long time has hosted the website that has the annotated Grateful Dead lyrics on it. It's a website that's done by David Dodd and uh, is, is considered to be an excellent source of information about the lyrics for the, the songs. So we made a case. We actually, after we met with the business manager, wrote a proposal and sent it to the band and uh, described what we would do with the archive. And we committed to make it available, collaborate and actually make it more open to the public and to use than we typically do with archival materials. That was also something that the band's manager told us was important. <clears throat> and so we, we made that commitment to them. And we also agreed that we would dedicate some space in the library to showcase some of the items from the archive. So eventually the band made a choice and they gave us the archive. We were not prepared for the amount of attention that this received uh, when the announcement was made. In fact, one of our campus trustees commented that he had never seen UC Santa Cruz featured on the front page of the Santa Cruz, or of the San Francisco Chronicle over the fold and in such a positive way. So this was the beginning of the public phase of having this archive. The same day, we had a press conference at the Fillmore in San Francisco that was attended by Bob Weir and Mickey Hart, as well as a number of other members of the band family, John Perry Barlow, uh, a number of other people. One of Jerry's daughters was in attendance. So 
Uh, and it was quite something because it was a true press conference with a room full of reporters, TV, cameramen, uh, all sorts of people really interested in what was happening with the archive. So again, we were getting the sense that the world was taking a lot of interest in this archive. We then um, went back and went to the warehouse and really started looking at what it was. The warehouse itself was 2,000 square feet and it was packed floor to almost 30 foot ceilings with materials. And uh, we didn't know exactly what was there. We knew there were um, records of the band's concerts. We knew that there were business records. We knew there were photographs, posters, t-shirts, other kinds of merchandise. Also a lot of material that fans had sent to the band. Uh, so we, we embarked on the process of packing up the material in the warehouse and bringing it to Santa Cruz. These were some of the file cabinets we brought along. Uh, I love some of the, the bumper stickers on them. They're a lot of fun. Uh, <clears throat> we also found a lot of ephemera as well as the files. And uh, we became very close with Eileen Law, who is actually considered the mother of this archive. Eileen was first a volunteer and then a paid employee for the band. She worked in their ticket office. And she has the true soul of an archivist. She kept all these materials and she organized them as best she could. And she even defied the band um, on multiple occasions when they told her to get rid of all that junk. Uh, in one case, she, she put it all in a closet in the building that they used at Fifth and Lincoln in San Rafael, just so that band members would think it had all gone away. Uh, but she held on to it and, and she has worked with us since that time to really um, make sure that we know what's in the collection and uh, take good care of it. One of the th other large components of the collection that we received was fan decorated envelopes. The band uh, sold tickets and made tickets available for people who wrote to them at their office. And people would write in, they really desperately wanted to get tickets to concerts, and they thought it became sort of uh, folklore that if the envelopes were decorated, there would be a better chance of actually getting the tickets. So as part of the collection, we received more than 16,000 envelopes decorated most of them front and back and uh, boxes and boxes of these envelopes and that's actually been kind of a fun treasure trove to have because we have people who come to visit the archive who wrote in for tickets and who find the envelope that they decorated in you know, 1981 so uh, it's been quite a trip back in time for some people so once we got the archive, our first step was to process it physically uh, using more traditional methods. So we, um, we arranged the collection, described it. Here's a copy of a record that was put in the online archive of California um, to let the world know again that we had the collection. We've also spent time reaching out and trying to make people aware of the scholarly aspect of this collection. One of the questions we get on a pretty regular basis is, why is this collection important? Isn't this just another rock band? And, and essentially, who cares? Uh, the answer is, a lot of people care. This was a very unusual band. It existed and they performed for 30 years, starting in 1965 uh, through 1995 until Jerry's death. Uh, they were incredibly improvisational, one of the first jam bands that performed. They had a very wide repertoire. One of the interesting things about the band is they could go to a city and have uh, three days of concerts to give and they would not repeat a single song in those concerts. They weren't a band that had a set 
show that they put on. So you'd go once and you'd see the show and then you'd go the next night and you'd see the same show over again. It was definitely a band that believed in creating an event and doing that spur of the moment and uh, drawing the audience into it. it. There was a very strong relationship between the band and the audience and the band felt that without the audience, they couldn't be as creative and perform as well. So it, it was important for them. So all of this has generated over the years a fair amount of interest in, on the part of scholars in a variety of disciplines. Uh, and in fact, the um, Southwest Texas and American Popular Culture Association have a Grateful Dead Scholars Caucus that meets every year and has met every year for 15 years. Uh, and that consists of two and a half days of papers given about the band, about their music, about the sociology of deadheads, uh, the, the group of people that followed the band around and that were dedicated fans of the band. And so we have started in the archive to put out uh, a journal called Dead Studies that is uh, the, much of the material that comes out of the Grateful Dead Scholars Caucus. Uh, here are also some uh, cover pages of some of the books that have been written about the band. Um, one of the first was Deadhead Social Science, which was edited by Rebecca Adams, a sociologist at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She was one of the first to teach about the Grateful Dead, and she got into a lot of hot water, politically speaking, for teaching that content. Uh, she's also been in touch with us, and we've been in touch with her, and uh, we're trying to work together on some projects around this. Um, some other books here, the, A Long Strange Trip, if you're wanting to read about the history of the band. This was written by Dennis McNally, the band's publicist, and a person who has deep knowledge of their history. And a recent publication, actually two recent publications, are Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead and Dead Letters, Grateful Dead fan mail that showcased many of the envelopes. In terms of our own outreach around the archive, one of the things that's often said about the band is that they, the deadhead community around them formed the very first social network. And so we've tried to build on that and create a real ongoing social network taking advantage of the tools that exist these days. So we have a blog. We also have a Facebook page. And that's been pretty interesting because uh, our library Facebook page has about 400 friends. Our Grateful Dead Archive Facebook page has more than 62,000 friends. So it tells us who likes what in, in our collections. Um, and another part of building community is to reach out in more traditional ways. So we're uh, doing a newsletter that comes out periodically that showcases some aspects of the collection or describes new materials that we've added. This is definitely a growing collection. Uh, and from the very first day that the announcement went out that the, the archive was coming to UCSC, we've been adding material to it. So uh, we continue to build relationships with, with deadheads and uh, members of the band family, and we continue to add content. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Robin, who is going to describe what we've done in terms of making the materials available online. Thank you all very much for coming uh, this morning. Um, this is an exciting topic to uh, kick off the, uh, the morning with, I think. Um, we, uh, we began, uh, this next stage of the project was really to, to focus around this building of a socially constructed archive. Um, as Ginny mentioned a little earlier, you know, one of the things that we worked with the band to do was to talk about how we could make the content available. And so building a, building a website that could uh, feature the band's content and also begin to uh, continue that, that sort of legacy of working uh, with the fan community was an important, important step for us. Um, 
the band had this very unique relationship with its fans. Um, it was really an exchange between the artists and the audience during the show. And the show was very paramount. Um, as you've heard, uh, the same set list was never performed uh, twice, the same song never in the same manner. And we, uh, we wrote and were uh, happy to receive an IMLS grant, a two-year IMLS grant, which went towards our process of building the socially constructed uh, uh, website. And what we, what we saw was that this was really a very unique opportunity to leverage this relationship between the band and the community to help build the collection. Um, we would enhance the content that the band gave us through the, the great uh, efforts of Eileen Law, but then build the, build the collection through capturing the fan experience. Our specific IMLS goals were to scan uh, some 45,000 items, um, to use Omeka as the essentially core of the website, to bring in uh, web resources uh, when appropriate into the collection, um, to work on developing a plugin that would uh, essentially enhance the exchange of information between Content DM and Omeka. And also, and you can well imagine this, uh, to identify and resolve some of the, the copyright issues that we might uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of encounter as we went into uh, scanning this collection. And as you can imagine, there might be a couple of issues that would be a part of that. Um, it's really been a very uh, library-wide effort to, uh, to do this work. Uh, we've drawn from special collections, uh, from digital initiatives, from our library IT staff, uh, as well as from uh, librarians with expertise in scholarly communication and IP. Um, we hired for the project uh, the Grateful Dead Archivist, um, myself as project manager, and also a programmer for the project. Um, Omeka was a very uh, appealing software for us to use um, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, it has the, the ability to create exhibits, which we saw as a, a very good way of being able to help uh, provide interpretation of the collection to give that enhancement to the collection, and also as a way to potentially, uh, in the long run, reach out to graduate students and faculty to help build content that would use the collection. Um, the other really important piece about Omeka is the fact that it has a, a user submission piece, and that was really critical to what we wanted to do with the project. Um, one thing, too, to really mention, I just want to say it right up front, and it'll, it'll be a theme that you see throughout the, my presentation, is the fact that um, as, as a library that's part of the University of California system, we have the opportunity to essentially leverage the services that are provided by CDL and the California Digital Library. And you'll note through the presentation that we're using the Online Archive of California, we're using the Web Archiving Service, we're using UC3 Easy ID for persistent identifiers, um, and we're also tapping the UC3 Merit Repository. We've also been working very, very closely with the staff at Omeka um, at George Mason University, and as well with the University of Virginia Scholars Lab, who've been doing an awful lot of development on the Omeka software. Okay, um, well, to, to jump, jump in here a little bit uh, deeper, um, one of the, the first things we needed to do then was to really think about this 600 uh, linear foot collection and determine what items were we really going to scan for the project. Um, we worked with the intellectual series arrangement and description uh, from the archives, um, and also with the Grateful Dead archivist's expertise, uh, Nick, Nick Merriweather, regarding some of the significant events in the history of the band. Um, you know, one of the, a good example of showing this is, is the idea that um, the Grateful Dead maintained their their show files, which would include their business correspondence about having a, having a show in a particular city as part of a tour. But in the show files, you'd find a great deal of things, the correspondence, you know, some of the financial arrangements, but you'd also find the tickets, you know, for example, the, the sample tickets. Well, for us as a, a project to scan, we were really very interested in, in just scanning the tickets, um, and we wanted to bring those out and you work with those as a particular format um, as we would begin to gear up for scanning. Um, 
you know, gearing up for digitization is much easier if you can go into production where you're really working around a format. So one of the things we needed to do was, as you can imagine, was to go into the show files and then begin to, to take out those items that would be relevant. This happened throughout the, throughout the entire process where you have your archival arrangement, but then what you need to do to actually scan is quite, is quite different. Um, the digital production really needs to happen at that sort of mass scale to be, um, and format scale to be efficient. Um, some of the materials that we have scanned uh, have been t-shirts, three-dimensional objects, photographs, 35 millimeter slides, and also videotape and audio tape. And you can imagine for each one of those formats, you've got a different kind of scanning arrangement and, and, and quite, quite honestly, different, different equipment that you need to use. Um, we also developed tools to guide the selection of content for the scanning. Um, one thing to, to bring to mind, and you can see it here on the, the slide, which is uh, a Grateful Dead timeline. And Nick was able to develop sort of the, the ultimate list of shows, as well as what were the significant events in the history of the band. And we were able to use that to essentially be able to target material that we wanted to scan in the collection. Um, the show, again, being the very preeminent uh, sort of baseline for how, uh, how the, the band would be documented uh, and how we would scan. Um, one of the, the big goals of the project then as well was to, to really engage, uh, engage the fans in crowdsourcing. Um, we, um, we, we developed, uh, before we even began scanning, we really, and then, and then the subsequent uh, process of then creating the metadata, we developed a, a strategy on how we were gonna engage our users. Um, we thought about it in terms of what what kind of metadata should we create and what metadata would we like to see our, our users create. And this, could, this, would, uh, this would be different depending on the, uh, the format that we were scanning. Um, and I've brought an example here to sort of show a, a photograph of uh, uh, fans waiting uh, outside the Fillmore East in 1970 for a, for a performance. And to the, uh, just to the other side of that is our Grateful Dead archive name authority file. And I, I illustrate this to say that right at the beginning, we decided that in the, in the images and throughout the collection, we would strive to identify the major players, you know, the members of the band. The band changed throughout the years, and, and particular individuals that were significant, like Bill Graham, you know, in the, in the history of the band. And that's what we would concentrate on, but it seemed a very logical thing to then, uh, to leave the other material, I'm sorry, the other sort of access points around names to, to the community as we, as we go live. So as we, as we move forward then, um, we will leverage then Omeka's tagging and comments to gather a lot of that other metadata around uh, individuals. Um, this is a, an example then of showing the digitization process that we went through. Um, this is Scott Campbell, one of our uh, digital technicians, scanning the envelopes that, uh, that Ginny has mentioned. Um, he's using a Creo scanner there and doing, uh, and doing three envelopes at a time. You can imagine uh, that was uh, an important thing for us given that we had over 16,000 of them to scan. And this is an example of a particularly nice envelope uh, uh, created by Michael Everett, who actually went on to be um, a poster artist for the Grateful Dead. Um, it, it, does, it did work in a sense that when, uh, when the fans submitted uh, art, the band took notice and they, they developed relationships with several of the artists to, to do work for the band. Um, I'm bringing up an example here then too, just in terms of the process. Uh, which is to say that we, we thought about our metadata, we did our scanning, and then ultimately we would load, um, load our, our, to create our objects in ContentDM. ContentDM is really serving as sort of our workhorse uh, repository for us, um, both for authoring metadata and for creating the structure for the digital objects. And you'll see a little further in the talk that we are, we're working on then doing that data exchange into Omeka. Um, Content DM is also important for us because it, it does serve as a way to integrate 
the Grateful Dead collection that we've scanned with other collections that are that are scanned as part of uh, as part of uh, special collections. Um, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. Omeka will be very separate, and we'll just be focusing on the Grateful Dead. But Kunten DM allows us to have that uh, that joint repository for uh, for linked content. Um, I just wanted to comment and say that the uh, the Abbey software has worked really well for us. Uh, that's a part of Kunten DM. The one thing that we've noticed is that uh, poor quality uh, original gives you poor quality OCR. Um, but we, uh, we've been very happy with it. Uh, we've done minimal correction of names, uh, again, in the, uh, in the text. Um, just thinking in terms of users that those are going to be the kinds of points that they're going to want to find, the, the, people, the people that are part of, uh, part of the texts, uh, be they artists or uh, the band members or photographers. But anything else, we again will turn to the crowd uh, to do uh, as, we, as we move forward. This is just kind of a little montage of some of the things that we've we've scanned. Uh, again, the uh, uh, you see here envelopes, fan envelopes, tickets, tour programs. Uh, wonderful picture of Jerry in the early years and the hate. It's a photo by Herb Green. The wall of sound, and then some of the T-shirts that we've scanned. My. Uh, my next few slides are going to really feature on uh, the development uh, of our website. Um, our website is still in, in progress. We're planning on uh, releasing the Grateful Dead Archive Online, or GDAO, as we've come to, come to speak of it. Um, it's the ubiquitous acronym, I guess. Um, but it is in development. We'll release it uh, at the end of June of this year. Um, I think. What's an important point to make is that with this website, we're really trying to balance um, the needs of the public, and in a sense, the deadheads, with the, with the need of those individuals that are going to engage in scholarly research. Um, it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing to, to balance, and I think that we, we'll, we'll see how it works. Um, we're planning on doing, uh, after release, some focus groups with uh, individuals to see um, what we might do uh, to help improve it for scholarly access, as well as with some of the fans. I'm, I'm quite convinced we're going to hear a lot from people. I mean, there's no question. I think it'll be a, a really a really interesting set of discussions. But we've, we've tried to, at this point, really strive to do something uh, that's kind of in the middle, middle ground at this point. Um, there's five major browsing points. You can see them at the top, I hope. Uh, it's essentially accessing the content by milestones, shows, artists, media, and fan art. Um, we have also feature uh, then uh, what's new about the site, exhibits, blog. Uh, you'll see up there in the right-hand corner, there's a little flag for contribute. And that's, that's going to be a very important key to this project, again, as a socially constructed archive. We really want to uh, encourage the users to contribute. Um, just sort of picking up here, um, this is going to be one of the major ways into the content. It's a milestone um, timeline. We're using the uh, University of Virginia's Neatline uh, uh, tool that they've developed as part of Omeka. Um, our programmer, Kevin Clark, has been uh, talking a great deal with the UVA staff at the Scholars Lab because um, we're really pushing, uh, pushing Neatline at the moment. Um, we're going to be putting over 2,000 shows into this and sort of having a, a timeline that will accommodate 2,000 shows and other significant events will be an interesting use of this. And so uh, stay tuned. We'll see how it works. Um, one of the other things we're doing is we're bringing the existing blog into GDAO. It's been a separate, a separate blog using um, Blogstop. Um, this is maintained by Nick Merriweather, our archivist. But again, we'll bring it into the uh, Omeka site and import the existing entries. Um, another feature is our oral history page. This is, again, a mock-up of what will be. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for that user community, again, to help develop, develop original content for the site. Um, we'll have five questions for them to, to provide uh, answers to. You know, what was your favorite show? What was your first show? It's really a way to engage them. We, uh, we, we hope it leads to even deeper oral histories. Uh, Nick Merriweather 
Our archivist will be having a story core where uh, interested parties could come in and they could actually do extensive um, oral histories with Nick in our museum, our sort of exhibit for the, the Grateful Dead. Um, but again, we see this as sort of a way to reach out and get the user community to participate. Um, they can either answer the questions as text or they can call the Google voice number that we'll have and leave a message, uh, essentially. Um, Google will supply us with a, a, an audio file and a transcript that we will then later turn into, uh, into a digital object. Um, one thing I think that's an uh, important point to make is that you have to register as a user to answer these questions. And uh, we have a pretty good feeling that anonymity is probably going to be an important factor here. And so um, you won't have to supply your name. It'll only be your email uh, so, or that email alias. So um, I think we'll have a richer collection by going, going in that route. <laughs> Um, we'll feature exhibits. One of the, the first exhibits that we will launch with will be the Europe 70 tour, 72 tour. Um, it's also important to note that uh, we'll have audio and video associated with the, with the, the project. Um, we had over 152 uh, videotapes that actually came with the collection from the Grateful Dead. Um, they end up being sort of documentaries, musical performances, um, as well as sort of TV coverage of when the dead was playing in a particular place. Um, we've had all those digitized, um, outsourced. Um, we've also been doing in-house the audio uh, uh, transfer to digital, um, the predominant material that's there are uh, radio broadcasts, which end up being sort of interviews with members of the band, as well as the concert line recordings. Um, Eileen Law and members of the bands would essentially have a recording that would let the fans know um, when the, the tour was kicking off, when tickets would be available for particular shows. And it's pretty wonderful to actually hear like Jerry's voice, for example, or Phil Lesh. Uh, and those will be available uh, for the, for, um, through the website. Um, another piece, again, that's a really important component of this whole website is the user contribution page. Um, this, again, is a mock-up. We're going to be asking for, for very, um, very minimal amounts of metadata uh, from the from the users, although we love it if they would give us more, you know, in terms of if they can actually give us a date and they can actually give us a location of something. But if they can identify a title and identify themselves, that'll that'll start it that'll start it off. Um, but what's particularly important to to note here is that um, we're asking users if they own the copyright or, or if they don't, uh, do they think they can make this available uh, via fair use? We're also giving them the option to pick one of three licenses as they submit. Um, two of them are Creative Commons, one of which would be for non-commercial use, the second one for um, commercial use, and then the third license is one where they would be granting the UC Regents uh, to grant our, our library the permission to, to use the material. Um, sort of hand in hand, and this hasn't gotten to the mock-up stage, it's still in, in wireframing, but we want to we wanna incorporate a wish list as part of the website, which is to really kind of target specific items we might be using, we might be looking for. Again, you know, a good sort of example of that is particular tickets that we might want to have for particular shows. And, and that would go very much hand in hand with the, the overall collection development policy that we have for the collection um, that will be available through the Special Collections website. Um, we sort of see this as sort of a balance. There's, there's that place where you know, certain kind of users are going to be interested in specific things. Again, I think that's sort of a place where the fans are going to be very interested in that. But there are other kinds of users that would be interested in, in what we're collecting uh, around the Grateful Dead uh, in a much more a deeper way and in some sense kind of a, a broader way. And we'll have that available uh, for those users to, to evaluate as well. Um, the Grateful Dead website would be really nothing without music to a certain extent. Um, it, it, is, it, is the, it is the baseline for the, for the collection. But 
when we received the, the collection, we did not actually receive any of the uh, original music at this point from the band. Um, contractual arrangements between Grateful Dead Productions and Rhino Records um, prevent us essentially from being able to post any of the recorded albums online. But what we decided to do to, again, make this a rich resource was to reach out to the Internet Archive, which has a, a very rich resource of fan-submitted tapes. Uh, as you know, the fan tape culture was very important to the whole uh, experience of the show. And the uh, Internet Archive uh, was very happy to see us uh, essentially uh, harvest uh, their metadata and bring that in as part of, uh, of the, uh, the website. Um, What's, this is kind of a, an interesting way to, to think about it, that we'll be incorporating Google Maps as a, as a view into the content. And the, the experience of the, the music coming from Internet Archive will be very much browsable through this, this location specific, uh, where each show was. Um, so you'll be able to, to click on this as an entry, and it'll bring up Internet Archive content as well as our content that we've scanned, as well as user-submitted content. Um, I think it's important to note here as well that we've, um, we've done our best to locate the uh, uh, GPS coordinates for particular venues, but some of these things are, are not on the map, per se. <laughs> and so we'll be reaching out to the, the community uh, to help us with specific coordinates if they, if they have them as, uh, as they're able to make them available. Um, We've also used the uh, web archiving service from CDL to essentially crawl 16 sites that we've identified. Um, the sites that, uh, uh, that we've crawled include things like fan blogs uh, that have images and commentary, um, as well as uh, the Grateful Dead Lyric website that was created by uh, David Dodds that Ginny mentioned uh, earlier. Um, we have 14 sites in the uh, in it uh, now. Two of them are, are still embargoed, um, but they'll be available in the next few months. Uh, but this is is something again as well that we've incorporated the mark record that we've created for each of the websites. That mark record is going into a mecca, and that bibliographic data will then be uh, again available through our search results. You can just see the the tab for the uh, the websites that will be there as well. I've only got about 100 more slides here, so hope you guys don't mind staying through the break. No. Um, one of the, the, I've hinted at this earlier in the talk, of course, um, is, is the whole intellectual property strategy around, uh, around this project. And um, really, what we've, what we've tried to do is really approach this in a way where how can we balance our, our sort of fair use, uh, fair use assessment and our interest in being able to put content up in a situation where it's still very much, much of it is still very much in copyright. And so there's sort of the fair use piece uh, working in conjunction with identifying rights holders and obtaining licenses uh, from them. Um, at the same time, too, there's a really very important value that we, uh, that we have at UC Santa Cruz which is also building those community relationships and goodwill in a, a, a I think, kind of in some ways, a very small uh, community of artists and photographers that are also very well connected. Um, I think a, a nice example of this is to think about, for example, some of the poster art that we've scanned. Um, there are over 600 posters that we've scanned and by doing um, copyright research, we have actually determined that some of them are in the public domain. Uh, but one of the, the questions we have is, um, would it be the right thing to just post that publicly available, make that publicly available, when uh, it might jeopardize a relationship with, uh, you know, with an artist? Uh, who some of them who were were burned uh, through some of the relationships they had with uh, uh, some uh, concert promoters, uh, Bill Graham, for example, uh, during the '60s. And so it is kind of a question. Um, you know, we're still we're still debating that a little bit, and we'll be talking with Ginny a little bit about what's the what's the right thing to do. But we've we've done our homework is really the important thing, and 
we've we've determined who the rights holders are, and we've we've done that research to determine if it's in the public domain or not. But the question will be, should we just uh, should we just post it just to an IP campus library restriction, or should we make it publicly available? And that's a that's a strategic question. You know, I think that uh, that libraries need to ask themselves. Um, one of the other things, too, that, uh, again, I mentioned is also just thinking about um, contractual arrangements that the band has had with, um, with Rhino Records as well and how that, how that works. Uh, we've, um, they, they did not particularly want uh, recorded music up on site, so uh, that, that the band would have done in a formal session. So we've... Um, We've been very careful about really documenting when that occurs in some of the audio recordings that we have, and then um, getting a sense of how long some of those performances are, and then making Rhino uh, aware of it uh, politely and just as a, as a good partner in this. Um, we're really very interested in, in posting it, and I think we've, we've gotten very good feedback from Rhino so far about those pieces of music that we've found. Um, Another important thing to just sort of relay to everyone is that we, we engaged the services of a consultant to help us with uh, this, this intellectual uh, property strategy. Um, we developed a strategy and then we uh, asked uh, Peggy Hoon, who is at North Carolina State University Charlotte, who's the uh, scholarly communications librarian, to, uh, to prepare a report to really look at the strategy that we had developed to help us fine tune it, but then also to really provide an environmental scan of current practices. It was, we were very happy that uh, in this time frame, just in the last couple of months, that the ARL best practices has come out. So that's been sort of further, um, further knowledge as well as sort of, um, I think, support for uh, where we want to go with this. Um, Peggy has also given us a, a nice sense of what she sees as sort of the risks associated with, with some of the collection formats, uh, some of the problems that might come up, you know, particularly um, just to say that uh, it's, there's no question that posting video is a real concern and uh, we had uh, putting entire works is an issue. That's one of the, one of the formats that are specifically most risky. And, uh, but we, we can uh, be within our rights to post just you know, sections, clips of those. So that's, that's a way that we're, uh, we're proceeding. Um, I wanted to just uh, briefly sort of speak a little bit to kind of the metadata environment that we see this IP work being done in. Um, each digital object will have uh, a rights status and a rights holder when it's available. Um, we provide copyright and terms of use policies on the website as well as the DMCA information and particularly the takedown policy that would be associated with that. Um, we've been coordinating with our DMCA uh, campus contact uh, pretty regularly on what our you know, relationship will be when we get a takedown, what we need to do, um, how that will follow through. Um, we've also been, just as an overarching piece, um, developing a real good communication channel with the community to, uh, to let them know that if, if we didn't know who the rights holder is, please come out and self-identify. You know, please let us know. So those are, those are sort of uh, steps we're beginning to take and as we roll out the website, we will, uh, we will go into high gear on that as well. Um, the strategy that I have here, I'm showing as a, just sort of a, um, a piece up here, was approved by our campus council Essentially what we did was to lay out by format uh, the risks that we saw associated with the particular format. Um, we had our consultant strategy. Um, we had our strategy that we then have uh, developed um, after, um, after the consultant and we uh, talked about and approved this with, uh, with Ginny. Um, the consultant, when available, gave us uh, sort of her opinions on access management, but we also um, have outlined um, the kind of access that we want to give per each format. Um, generally, we're looking uh, to provide um, essentially uh, medium res JPEGs at 72 dpi uh, for the material and to, uh, to essentially only restrict uh, to campus when we have to. We want to try to, to put as much things out as we can publicly, but we will, uh, we will uh, of course, um, 
uh, use the, our, our fair use assessment uh, to help us inform that what we what we make available just uh, just to the campus. Um, I just wanted to sort of briefly speak. This is our uh, our fair use assessment and copyright copyright issues analysis tool that um, that we developed. Um, uh, I will do a shout out to uh, UC San Diego uh, Library where I used to work and uh, we did some very good work on, on some of these issues as well and uh, I took this, uh, this intellectual property to uh, Santa Cruz. I hope my colleagues here don't mind. <laughs> but it was, it was good thinking we did there and uh, we've, we've taken it and adapted it to, uh, to Santa Cruz as well. Um, the, um, uh, our, our head of special collections uh, went through and uh, evaluated the, the Grateful Dead collection, uh, particularly you know looking at what the copyright status was for particular formats, and then to obviously evaluate based on the, the four factors of fair use, purpose, uh, nature, amount used, and market impact. Um, we were taking that that information and then again sort of balancing it with the. The, the, the goal of actually going out and getting licenses from the uh, uh, specific, um, specific artists and photographers. Um, we identified over 400 uh, of these individuals in the collection, and then we were able to do the research to find over 100 addresses uh, for whom we sent out letters and emails uh, requesting uh, their interest in participating to let us post and asking them to sign a license. Um, to date, we have received uh, 46 licenses out of that 100 that we've sent out, but it's really only uh, a small percentage, you know, about 10% of the larger, you know, amount of photographers and artists that we found in the collection. Um, the, um, the strategy that we engaged in to research the contact information was to talk to some of our Grateful Dead Productions uh, uh, staff uh, who still knew some of these individuals. Um, we also researched professional databases for artists and photographers. Um, we leveraged where we could the research that had been performed by others for addresses, um, for publishers of uh, books like The Art of Rock, and we also did Google web searches. And we've documented all of this really well in spreadsheets so that we will have it on hand to, to indicate uh, the work that we did um, to, to do uh, the due diligence. Um, we've also developed a rights database that will maintain all of this contact information. And the, uh, the rights database will actually uh, work dynamically in Omeka. So in a, a situation where we have, a, we have contact information for a rights holder, we'll actually link to the database and it will provide the contact information. And so the, the user of the, the Omeka GDAO site can get in touch with the individual uh, directly to, uh, to use the work. Um, I've also just... Um, Let's see here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to show we got uh, we actually got a license from Wes Wilson, who was one of the major poster artists uh, artists working in uh, in Family Dog, and uh, that was a very big step for us. It's really a wonderful thing to have Wes participate participate in this um, and to give us his blessing. I think it will uh, speak very well to uh, to the future and hopefully uh, other artists supporting what we're doing. Um, so I'm really I'm wrapping up here. Uh, the, the the next and last piece I wanted to just sort of speak about was sort of the back end of uh, of the Grateful Dead Archive Online. Um, there's a there's a sort of a, a a couple of major things I wanted to to say here, um, and one of the the biggest pieces for us was how to um, how to how to bring together Omeka, Content DM, and our use of the, the UC3 Merit Repository, as well as uh, how to uh, bring user submissions into an environment that could be managed for access and also managed for preservation. Um, uh, if, you, if it wasn't clear from speaking earlier, um, we're building the Omeka record objects from content DM records. Um, and so being able to enable that data exchange between content DM and Omeka was really uh, critical. Um, one, of the, 
one of the things for us oops, that was a, uh, a, a sort of an important uh, sort of milestone for us early on was the fact that we couldn't use the OAI harvester um, that's available through Content DM. Uh, that really wasn't viable for us because you can only use it if the collection is published. And we weren't at, aren't at a stage, you know, essentially that we wanted to publish our Content DM material. This is this is something where Content DM is serving as sort of a, a back a background uh, tool for us to create the data, to provide that structure, and then we're ex we're essentially exporting it and bringing it into Omeka. So the harvester wouldn't work again because uh, it would we could only harvest from uh, Content DM published collections. Um, so we thought that the the Content DM API would be our answer. But uh, and you can imagine that uh, for us, um, our programmer was very excited. The API for Content DM is very much about how you can you can publish um, you can publish Content DM and sort of configure the collections through the the Content DM website. And we wanted to use it as a way to really get the the content out in a very automated the, the metadata out in a very automated way. Um, but what what Kevin uh, thought was a feature in the API actually turned out to be a bug as far as Content DM was concerned. Um, they're, they're working with us now to, to help enable that exchange and they've been very supportive about it, but they as any organization has releases and things that they need to do. So in the meantime, um, what we did was to essentially to screen scrape uh, the, the metadata uh, to bring it into Omeka. Um, one of the, the other uh, really important things to mention here too is the fact that we we really wanted to have persistent identifiers and we wanted to have uh, if you can imagine we're having uh, material live in three different repositories in a sense in content DM in Omeka and and merit um, it's it's not perhaps the most ideal situation but it's the situation we're in at the moment and we'll continue to learn and evaluate as we as we move uh, forward working with the three uh, services but having a persistent identifier was really key across those so we uh, we chose to use uh, UC3 easy ID um, and its resolution capacities as well um, and that that arc will then be the same throughout uh, wherever wherever it's li living in the uh, in the, the repositories. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to just really wrap up, and this, this speaks to this diagram here, we've got a couple of things going on, um, but essentially at the top there are two streams. Uh, the top stream is about the user submissions assigning an ARC and bringing them ultimately into the merit repository. The same thing is also happening from Content DM as well, where we're assigning an ARC and then bringing them into to merit. Um, some of this is happening, some of it is still, uh, you know, in the, the testing phase. Um, but the top, the top uh, workflow I really wanted to, to speak to in the last few minutes here, and that's about the user submission process. Um, we wanted to, to, again, you go back to one of our goals here, which was really to, to engage the community in the building of this archive. So we decided something that would be really interesting would be to engage the community in curation of the objects. Because um, one of the things that we've learned from uh, Nick, uh, Nick Merriweather, our archivist, is the fact that um, the fans being very creative sometimes will author fake things, fake fake posters, fake tickets, and so something that would be uh, really a very useful thing would be to engage the community in identifying those those fakes. Now, from a um, from a historical perspective, the fact that they're fakes is actually very interesting, and that's great, and we'll we'll preserve it. But it's really important from an authenticity perspective to say, you know. When the Grateful Dead was the Warlocks and they used to play at the pizza parlor in Menlo Park, they probably didn't have a ticket, you know. So when somebody creates a ticket and submits that, um, we we need to know right up front if if it's authentic, if it's the real thing. So so there, when a user submits content, we'll have some we'll have some filters to obviously uh, catch spam as best as we can, and in our FAQ we will indicate um, you know, sort of file size limits and the kind of things we're looking for. But 
we plan on having the user submission go live. Um, there'll be an arc that's created and assigned to that item so that it'll have its persistent identifier right away. The content will be publicly available, but it'll be visually, visually different. It'll have a slightly different look to it, and it won't be able to be socially bookmarked or commented, uh, or socially bookmarked. But you will be able to comment on the object. And uh, it, it's in that that we uh, hope to get uh, user, you know, user information about the object. Um, right now, we're seeing this curation period is happening for about a week. You know, we might end up, uh, it might end up being two weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But once that period of curation is over, um, it will then officially become an object that we want to submit to Merit. And we'll actually mint the ARC, create a METS object uh, from Omeka. Um, the Dublin core metadata that came from ContentDM will be mapped to mods. So we'll be submitting a METS mods object into Merit. We chose to go that way to try to be as interoperable as possible um, uh, for the future. And I'll just also just make the statement that, you know, we, we were looking at METS and we chose METS because we knew we needed some kind of structure. Um, you know, we, Kevin and I talked about, well, would OAI, ORE be something to think about, but that seemed a little over the top. But uh, so, so METS is the way to go. Um, Merit doesn't require METS, but it was just something that, uh, that we thought was, was, was critical for thinking about uh, future uses. Um, so let me just wrap up here uh, quickly. Um, there's issues to, that we'll continue to resolve and think about, uh, things about synchronization between content DM, Omeka, and Merit, uh, thinking about redundancy. Um, there's ideas to continue to explore, um, you know, how we can do more work with crowdsourcing. Um, there's, there's things to monitor in terms of the content DM community as well. Uh, we're, Institutions like Simon Fraser have done some great work of, of integrating Drupal with Content DM um, using the API. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just raising that as uh, would that be something more efficient for us in the future versus Omeka? But you know, we'll we'll see how see how all these things uh, play out. Um, Ginny here for a second. Okay, so d going full circle, going back to the physical, um, this Dead Central is actually the space that will be dedicated to the archive in uh, one of the libraries on the Santa Cruz campus. We're in the process of constructing it right now and it will open later this spring. And one of the things we have received from a donor is uh, this statue of Jerry's hand, which now sits on this pedestal outside of Dead Central, and we're hoping it will become something of an icon for the space. And our intention going forward is to really link up the physical and the virtual, and uh, put exhibits online, as Robin has mentioned, and showcase the GDAO in the space that we have. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we're really excited about it. It's been a terrific project, and. Uh, uh, fun as well as a lot of hard work. So um, we'll stop there and, and see if you have any questions. I think we have just a, a few minutes for questions. Hi. Um, you mentioned that I think three staff had been hired specifically for this project. Mm -hmm. Um, is that basically all they do? Is just work on work on. Uh... Do we answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, Robin and Kevin, who were hired for the project, yes, work on the project. Nick Merriweather, our Grateful Dead archivist, is um, he's actually a permanent employee now, so he is a member of our special collections department. He focuses on this collection, but he also helps out. Um, he works the special collections service desk and and does other kinds of work. He does instruction, in fact, um, so, and not instruction about this collection, but general instruction for a writing program. So he's integrated into the library. 
Right. And I imagine there must be a, a, a number of other staff who are also uh, heavily involved as well. Is oh, that, yes. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I've, I've pretty much tried to tap everybody in the library you know, for <laughs> some part of that. Thank you. No other questions? Oh, Julia. You mentioned about um, the, the uh, I guess, the user-created content that they're going to supply to you in terms of uh, things that they might create themselves that say, I was there, but there wasn't anything there, there kind of thing. But what about people who want to contribute something, but they want to hang on to it themselves? Are you going to have them loan it to you so that you could digitize it and add it to the collection? Or is, is that the intent? So, you know, so if I had a ticket from a game and I, or from a game, <laughs> see where my head is at? <laughs> yeah, if I had a ticket for an event and I didn't want to give it up yet, could I send it to you to digitize, but then send it to you, have it sent to you later? Sure, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, anticipating or hoping that There'll be a lot of digital submissions, in a sense of that, that that uh, that uh, individuals could scan it themselves and keep their original and send us send us that scan, submit it through the website. Um, but there there could be circumstances when um, you have something and you don't have the ability to scan it, and you'd like to to do a more sort of manual process, and we'll definitely be able to support support that. And and frankly, I I think too, in in some ways. Um, you know, it may end up being that uh, uh, users submit a, a digital item and our archivist uh, will, will decide that he would really love to have the original if it's possible. And we'll probably reach out to, uh, to users um, to ask them if they'd be interested in that at some point in time. You mentioned that, um, I actually have two questions, so I may stand here. <laughs> you mentioned that you were interested in crowdsourcing. Um, artists, um, uh, photographers, those types of things. Have you thought about whether or not people will start tagging themselves attending concerts? Um, because from a, from a person who likes cutting edge music, I think it would be interesting to see who attended different concerts. I remember reading a while back that um, the former Prime Minister of the Czech Republic attended a concert at the 930 Club in DC and now I feel really special that he and I hung out at the same place. So, you know, wondering those kinds of things, whether or not you're prepared for people to tag themselves, because it might be interesting to see that, absolutely. you know, Lenny Kravitz's first concert was The Grateful Dead or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you're I think prepared is a really, you know, put that in quotes, because um, what the volume is going to be is really going to be how, what's the scalability of that. But, but indeed, um, what, our, what our intent was, we developed the name authority file to, to essentially um, tag before, you know, when we're creating the metadata record in content DM, to give us the opportunity to identify those principles the, in, that are in photographs, but to, yes, very much so, open up who might be in those other photographs. And I think that, that image I showed of the fans waiting outside to go into the Fillmore East in 1970, we don't know who those people are, and we really do hope that they, they do identify. And, and I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how this plays out. Um, you know, you could, you could imagine, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going out there in terms of a visualization, but you could, you could imagine people potentially having uh, uh, sort of seating plans for concert halls, and this was my ticket, and this is where I was, and this is who I am, and you know, it's, it's, it's possible that this could end up being really creative and that this might be the kind of uh, thing that users want, and um, I, we're thinking about it. Uh, what we'll be able to accommodate will be something um, that we'll, we'll obviously evaluate, but, but it, would be, it would be really neat 
to, to do that, that if you and Lenny Kravitz and the, uh, the Czech <laughs> president all went to the same... <laughs> you might see me there, too. Yeah. So. Well, I think, and I think, too, if you're finding a fan base, that's the fan base that would get you to that point of, of most fans. The other question I had was, um, have you had other bands archives approach you about how to do this? Because I could imagine um, growing up in a family full of Beatles fans, um, my aunt has an amazing archive in her own right of her experience with the Beatles concert tickets and that sort of thing. So I was curious if other bands have approached you or other institutions have approached you because they have collections similar to this. Um, and, and they're wondering kind of how to go about doing something similar because you have had a lot of um, press about this, so. Um, we haven't, because we haven't launched it yet, I don't think we've had um, the, exactly the kinds of inquiries you're wondering about. We have had um, casual conversations, say, with some people who are attached to the Grateful Dead but who also have relationships with other musicians and bands. And they're really watching what we do with this. So I think, I think starting this summer when we launch the, the website, I think that's when we expect to get some more conversations going. And of course we hope, I mean, because we're, Santa Cruz, if you don't know California, is about 70 miles south of San Francisco. And, um, and it is a big music venue. So we're hoping that, that some of the bands that have played in Santa Cruz regularly will be interested and will take notice. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> I, I imagine that there are a lot of bands out there with, with a lot of crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope it's not crap. <laughs> So uh, we've actually run over time. I want to let you go and get some coffee or take a break. So thank you for coming this morning.